cop's first duty is to the uniform. It makes an officer part of the blue line. Trusted, respected. But the uniform's no use to agents sent undercover to infiltrate New Zealand's organised crime networks. And you just had this feeling that the whole pub knew exactly who you were. To become anonymous, undercovers give up their own identity to live side by side with lawbreakers. Good agents become criminals. That's how they work. For many agents, life on the wrong side of the law is addictive. You can't stand in a room full of deck smokers and not smoke deck. I know you're not supposed to, but, uh, well. A dangerous game played by deadly rules. Undercover officers put both body and soul on the line. I was supposed to be the good guy. And I was a nasty little prick. For these officers and for the controversial program, does the end justify the means? Over the next three weeks, agents from 40 years of undercover policing take off their masks and tell all, revealing how this secret club grew. From catching prostitutes to targeting gangs, hard drugs and more, always riding a fine line between right and wrong. Every conversation you have has got implications. Every drug deal you do has got implications. Every time you go to the pub and you, you shake hands with different people, it's got implications for your, for your operation. So when you're talking to a guy in one corner of the pub, you've got to be mindful of who's pulling into the car park. You've got to be looking at the person who's walked in the door. You've got to be looking at who's talking to who. So every time someone asks you a question, you've got to think through all these tactical aspects of your, of your operation and then deliver your answer. crime finally got serious in the early 70s. Old school scams, brothels, bookmaking, illegal liquor became old hat. The stakes were raised by hard drugs, homegrown or smuggled in by multinational syndicates. Waging war on a new breed of criminal meant following the lead of international police. The New Zealand undercover program was officially born in 1974. Agents sent to the new unit were guinea pigs for a crime-fighting strategy whose real effects were unknown. During its 30-year history, the undercover program has been the most controversial tactic used by the New Zealand police. Some agents still remember the innocent milk bar days of the 50s and 60s, when police would occasionally go plain clothes to spy on small-time pushers or pimps. In the decades before the National Undercover Program started, young officers joined the Vice Squad. More used to upholding public decency than bringing down drug runners, to cops like Constable Graham Brown, vice work sounded like a bit of a lark. I'd say undercover work back in those days was about as basic as you could get. I had just come back from a holiday in Rarotonga. Uh, my hair had grown and I felt I wasn't ready to go back to actual police work, clean myself up, etc. So I went to see uh, a detective superintendent in Auckland. I just walked straight in and said, do you need an undercover cop? And he just picked up so quickly, and he was on the phone while I was in the room, and he said, yep, Christchurch. Just like that. Instead of any formal training, Graham was simply put on a train. Within 24 hours, he'd relocated the length of the country and joined a criminal underworld. His qualification for this new role was nothing more than his appearance. My look was that of a, a person who was in some sort of scene. I wore a red leather jacket. I had, most of the time, a granddaddy, pink granddaddy singlet on. And I had a pair of jeans and uh, suede cowboy boots and a braided belt that I'd made myself, and I just looked so far removed from looking like a police officer. It wasn't even funny. Nobody ever considered that undercover police existed. I could have probably bought drugs anywhere. It was the end of the summer of love, so Graham joined the scene. Before long, he was going to the right kinds of parties where small-time dealers were pushing to the curious and willing. The kind of parties where someone might just pass you a joint. 
I must have looked a dork trying to bloody hold a mouthful of smoke and then blow it out as if I'd uh, inhaled it. And I got told by someone I was with that I should really just smoke it properly. But uh, whatever I'd been there for, I'd, I'd achieved my purpose. And going to that party, I met a person who introduced me to Mr. Leonardo Pagliara, an Italian hairdresser from Genoa. And I distinctly remember him saying, that's a gorgeous leather jacket, where'd you get it? <laughs> and I'm going, no. He just opened up this bag and poured out a couple of thousand tablets of LSD onto the table. I was shit scared, I was crapping myself the whole time. I said, you know, I'm, a, I'm a cop here and I'm in this house full of bloody junkies. So I said, I'll just grab a couple of tabs if you're right. And I paid him $12 and I had matches in my pocket. So I put these two tablets in closed it shut, put it in the jacket pocket, and I was out of there, and I remember walking out the door going, fuck, where do I go now? Plain clothes assignments were short-term, off the cuff. The dealer was quickly arrested, and as soon as Graham was called as a witness, his cover was blown. And as I walked into the, the court, this guy that I'd previously met um, just looked at me and said, round one to you, Mr Brown, and that was it. Anybody in that court then knows you're a policeman, and because I had a fairly distinctive look, it was time to leave Christchurch. As an agent in the days before formal training, he was learning crucial lessons on the job. This DIY approach was fine when the targets were small timers, but it wasn't long before Graham was targeted by ruthless organised criminals. As crime changes, so have policing methods. His rookie days were in the early 60s, but Rob Moody has seen all the developments since. The police were held in very high regard in the community. Now, the only weapon the police needed to protect themselves in those days was the uniform. We had an undercover program, but it was like uh, trying to catch out uh, licensees um, having their liquor premises open after hours. It was try like trying to catch bookmakers uh, bookmaking when it was illegal. When you look at it now, it was all pretty innocuous uh, stuff. Later, a police chief, young Rana Waitai, wasn't even on the force when they asked him to go undercover in 1965. His target was Auckland's notorious brothel madam, Flora McKenzie. Flora had been knocked off a couple of years before that and, and she had vowed and declared publicly, this is the last time an undercover cop will ever get into my brothel. And that's the one challenge, you know. I thought, now, how am I going to get into this place? If I bowl in there, I'm going to have to do the D-Day. -day. And I knew that, no, much as I may have liked to, I just couldn't do that, because sooner or later I'm going to get up and give evidence about this. So I went and recruited one of my mates. And uh, he pays over my money and goes off and uh, with a, a lady and does his thing. But the important thing, it put me in the place. And so I wasn't a stranger when I, um, about a fortnight later, I come back. And this time I had the, the money. On the second visit, Rana dispatched his mate to fetch the raiding party as he headed to a bedroom. Rana's aim was to get the prostitute into a compromising position without being implicated himself. She got undressed and positioned herself on top of the bed and Rana takes off his jacket and sits down and takes off his shoes and undoes his laces and the lady she's sprawled out in the bed waiting wondering what's you know why well, I'm so long taking my socks off <laughs> and then comes the, the lady right, party and the Flora comes in and says oh no that's my that's her that's her boyfriend it's a, I said oh no Flora no, no it's not like that at all <laughs> Rana knew plenty about the blue uniform. He'd never meant to wear one. But as cover blown out of a job, he signed on for police college. About the second night I was out on the beat, I walked into this last doorway in, uh, in, in Lambton Quay, and I stopped dead in my tracks. I thought, shit, it's a bloody cop. And it was my, my own bloody reflection. <laughs> it was my own reflection, and it stopped me in my tracks. By the early 70s, city life was heating up quickly. Recreational drugs were now fashionable. The battle lines between lawbreakers and law enforcers shifted dramatically. Police realised drugs weren't just opening the minds of hippies and dropouts, 
but now formed the base of organized crime syndicates. The homegrown cartel that hit international headlines was the infamous Mr. Asia Group, a maelstrom of sex, drugs, money and murder that revolved around Terry Clark and Marty Johnston. Estimates say they smuggled over a billion dollars worth of heroin around the world. So plainclothes officers under a great deal of pressure with very little training had to rapidly sharpen up their act. We're talking here about the Mr. Asia era when you do the wrong thing in the drug industry, you get a bullet in your head. And that was going on. The stakes were raised. What had started out as dress up for Graham Brown was now deadly serious. When he returned from Christchurch to Auckland in the early 1970s, the growing cartel was starting to flex its muscle. I was in a nightclub and uh, a fairly reasonably heavy figure in the Auckland underworld came up to me and said, I know you, I know what you do. If you're here in half an hour, you're dead. I'm going to get a shotgun and I'll shoot you. And I was gone from there like a bloody rat up a drain pipe, I'll tell you. The small deals Graham had been busting started to get bigger and bigger. He was soon in the orbit of underworld players like Doug Wilson, later a key Mr. Asia dealer. Graham set up a deal to buy a large stash of LSD from Wilson. I was going to buy $3,000 worth. That's what I had in my pocket. All marked notes. Dougie Wilson was sitting next to me. The person behind Doug got out of the car, walked about 50 metres down Minnehaha Avenue to where there was a Jag parked uh, in a driveway. He got handed a, a brown paper bag, came back to the car and gave it to Doug. Doug gave it to me. I looked in it. There was all these red and green tablets in it. So I handed over my money and it got handed to the guy in the back seat. And the signal that the deal had gone down was I was going to kick the left-hand front tyre. So I got out and I just kicked it. And Dougie's still sitting in the front seat, just looking at me, and I just prepared to walk around the back, and all of a sudden, and detectives from everywhere. But the guy in the back seat did a bolter. He ran down the street, onto the beach, and disappeared. All the Ds were chasing this guy, and I thought, I'm the only one here with Dougie. So I just kicked off my boot and took out my ID card, and I said, you ain't going anywhere, Doug. I sit here, and he said, you fucking mongrel. He was hot, but he couldn't have done anything. If he'd had a go at me, I'd have just completely nutted off it, and, and he was only half my size. Yeah, nice, pleasant enough guy, but just a drug dealer at the end of the day. Just a drug dealer. I had the feeling that we've nailed something good, and we had. We'd nailed a goodie. That was 1,013 tablets of LSD, and it made the headlines next morning. And I was walking down Queen Street, and I bought a paper, I was about to be groomsman at a friend's wedding, and I'm thinking, oh, fuck. And they gave my name. Constable Graham Allen Robert Brown. He'd been charged with selling me LSD, and they put my whole name in it, and I walk around and go, who here knows me? Mm. With criminals now paranoid, and millions of dollars at stake in everyday deals, suspicion of insiders was growing. The police realised that part-time undercover operations would not be enough to stem a rising crime wave. To infiltrate these crime networks, they would need their agents to push the boundaries further and stay undercover for longer. Now a respected academic, Greg Newbold has a checkered past. In 1974, he was dealing heroin. The police were really running to try and keep up with what was going on. And, uh, and to, to develop sophisticated um, surveillance operations and, and busting operations to try and control it, because they were under immense pressure from the public and the media. Well, the police, in their wisdom, decided they would try the undercover program. How does one go about it? Well, I guess in great Kiwi tradition with number eight wire and innovation, they sent people out and they had consequences. Neither the administration nor the agents had any idea what effect long operations would have on them. And the new style of policing soon started claiming victims. The haphazard plainclothes operations were over. This first highly secret intake to the new undercover program of the New Zealand police was in 1974, by invitation only. 
Inside the program, officers were now given clear roles, either as an agent or an operator. The agent would put on the mask, mix with criminals, gather evidence, and try to maintain their cover. Whereas in the police, you have to uh, essentially you know, deal with the scum of the earth. Um, as an undercover agent, you have to live with it. I mean, and that's just a whole different ball game. First of all, I think you need to be a good actor. You need to be able to present yourself as the kind of person that um, they expect you to, to be, and so you need to be able to adopt a certain identity and do so very credibly. The operator worked behind the scenes, setting the objective of each mission, keeping track of exhibits and money, doing whatever they could to help their agent. The operator is basically the link between the agent and, and, and the police force. They're managing the operation, they're managing the books, they're managing the funds that are coming in and out, and uh, obviously managing the exhibits and things. And you're their only link with reality in some ways. These first officially trained and resourced undercover agents got immediate results, easily infiltrating the drug scene and stacking up arrests. But the advantage of surprise could only work once. We were scared of undercover cops. Uh, there had been one successful operation involving two undercovers who had a flat. So everyone was paranoid after that. We were all terrified, you know, who was an arc and who wasn't, and who was a cop and who wasn't. At a time when crims were highly suspicious of outsiders, Patrick O'Brien was drafted into the brand new program. He deployed in 1974. Really, I had no idea what I was getting into. I had really no idea or understanding of the lifestyle of, of a criminal. I'd grown up in a very different environment and was ignorant and naive of, of such things. A Catholic schoolboy from Wellington, Patrick was an archetypal all-rounder, a prefect, member of the First Fifteen, a talented athlete and musician. He was a principled, ambitious young man who joined the police to do good. One of the things that was always instilled in me growing up was to always do your best and to always use your gifts or your talents to help others. So one was always left with a sense of duty that one was required to give something back. I guess in a very simplistic and probably idealistic way as a young man, my idea was to become a policeman and uh, make society a better place by locking up criminals. And really throughout my policing career, short as it was, all I was really interested in was locking up criminals. That's what it was all about. The undercover program had only been running a very, very short time. In fact, I think from memory, I was only in the second intake. Patrick was sent to a training seminar. These highly secret spy classes were usually held at isolated conference venues. Recruits were exposed to drugs for the first time, though it was clear that drug use was not condoned. It was the first time in my life I'd actually even seen marijuana or cocaine or heroin or any of these things. Um, so it was, I was fascinated by it. But in terms of actual skills that we were given as to how to handle it, there was no training in that regard, mainly because there was, no, there was no body of experience. The word simulated was, was used, and I had never w heard the word simulate before. Agents say that police ignorance of the drug world was shown by the policy of simulation. If agents were offered marijuana, the official line was they could accept but must pretend to smoke it. So I left the place with this notion of that I would pretend to use drugs if I was even in a situation. Um, but I had no idea really, in reality, how, how I would pretend to do that. You could never get away with that. You tell them, they'll, 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 if anyone's suspicious about you, they'll be taking a good look at you and see whether you inhale deeply. You can get away with not shooting up. You can get away with not using hard drugs, but you can't get away with not smoking marijuana. Keen to start arresting bad guys, Patrick began to make physical changes. I went out and got an earring. Um, I tried to chip off my sort of private school accent. Tried to lose some of my nice table manners. You know, just a lot of the things that I carried with me, which were a part of me, which had no use or place in, 
in the world I was going into. Before too long, Patrick was rubbing shoulders with criminals. Moral questions of lying and pretense were quickly lost beneath the realities and challenges of the job. And it was just a, simply a matter of just fronting up to them and starting conversation and engaging them so that within the first few minutes, this person wanted to spend time with you. It was a seduction. That's really what it was. It was a seduction. Yeah. I can't. I realised very early on that simulating probably wouldn't work. Um, I didn't even know how to do it really, so how could I pretend to do it? So I, just, I, had, I made a conscious decision that I really needed to at least experience what the effect that these things had. So I got stoned. Got stoned. And I, I remember thinking, why is this against the law? This, what's wrong with this? This is actually quite a nice feeling. <laughs> I worked with one agent who spent his whole time with me as we travelled around going, hey man, this is like being in a movie. And it was. It was like being in a Cheech and Chong movie. Unlimited access to the best drugs, hanging out with pretty girls, going to all the in parties, being seen with all the, the flash boys in town, and being paid for it. Captured by the thrill of the con, Patrick was particularly good at this work. He felt his sense of duty was being fulfilled. He was locking away crooks and having a good time to boot. One morning in 1974, his arrests filled an entire session of the Hamilton High Court, earning him a letter of commendation from the judge. Word of this charismatic cop spread like wildfire on both sides of the law. And at a meeting, this young man was mouthing on about they should really watch out for this guy called Pat O'Brien, who he had met uh, in, in another town, and this is what he looked like, and um, he was a narc, and they should be very careful. And I had never seen this man before, but he had the name right, and the description was pretty close, and he was dead right that if Pat O'Brien got onto them, they were probably going to be arrested. <laughs> he loved arresting criminals so much, he worked up a song he normally sang to himself on the way to and from assignments. On arriving in Tao Happy, as it would be coming down the hill, I'd be singing to the tune of Hello Dolly, it would be Hello to Happy, it's so nice to see you again today. But, and I had my own little words. And, and then when I was leaving, I'd, be, I'd sing the same song. I put you assholes back where you belong. <laughs> Basically, thank you, it's been nice. And cut you, you bastards. <laughs> Tony Bouchier was in the next undercover intake. A year after Patrick, there had been a distinct development in agent training. The reality of undercover work was already proving that agents needed better grounding in drug culture. In training, what they do is they'd have a one night which they would call the simulation night, and that was the night that they were going to teach you how to simulate this cannabis in a whole lot of group of people. And a lot of them absolutely naive. I'd never touched the stuff in my life up until that point in time. We sat the night away smoking this endless supply of cannabis that was supplied to us. And the simple fact was, was that drug consumption was an essential key to getting into the drug scene. It was known by the agents, it was known by their operators. Tony was stepping into an entirely different world from that of his tight-knit, middle-class family of nine. This is a family photo. It was just before Tony would have um, joined the police force. He was very conservative, very upright, short back and sides. This is how you behaved. Very moralistic. Yeah, ideal police material, I have to say. And was told that uh, I was... they had chosen me to go down to Queenstown. Um, one of the reasons why I think in those days I had a mop of blonde hair, I was tall and skinny, I looked a little bit like a skier and they wanted somebody to go down there. Tony was promptly sent to the tiny resort town, but there was a hitch. His operator was the local uniformed policeman. Secret meetings would be tricky. His house was right in the middle of Queenstown, next to the police, Queenstown police station and uh, next to the, uh, the district court down there. He was there with his wife and he had um, two kids. The police house where we lived was actually right smack in the middle of town. I mean, you, you probably couldn't have the worst place to have, you know, a, a, an agent you know, visiting the, his operator or, or, or the police, you know. So no doubt that's why the back fence got good use, I would think. The only time I ever visited them was about one o'clock in the morning, is that I'd sneak in sort of through back sections and under a hedge and that sort of thing. and sort of knock on his back door. My sister and I had what we thought was a prowler 
around the back of our house. We were the only ones in the house, and my sister was pretty petrified about this prowler trying to get into the house. Being brave as I was, I decided I was going to go out and sort him out. Um, I was petrified myself, so I went out there and he had scarpered, thank goodness, because I don't know what a 13 year old was going to do anyway. My father then decided that he'd better let on who this regular visitor is, so that's how we got to meet the gentleman concerned. All our meetings started at one o'clock in the morning, and I'd keep little notes on pieces of paper at time, date, place, etc., all the stuff that you needed, and so that when I got back, because sometimes I would come back with maybe 12 or 15 buys under my belt, and uh, the only place that I they would never be found was in my shoe. So I used to carry these notes around in my socks, and uh, then pull them out, these smelly notes, and we used to write up all the statements uh, of the events sort of surrounding that. We had our own regular hippie that we had as a friend and, and he was our secret. Some kids have secret imaginary friends, we, we had one that was real, I mean that was great. But his son joined the police and joined the undercover program. His son sort of got a taste of it because because of the work that I did. Tony's target in Queenstown was a dealer who was supplying the resort community with illegal apresky substances. Within a few weeks Tony was helping his target move into his flat. He was in the backseat of my car when we were driving out to my to, to my rented accommodation and he pulled out a, a pistol and I said to him, what the fuck have you got that for? And uh, he told me it was for narcs and rip-off agents. And uh, like I certainly knew that, you know, that I filled one of those categories. And he was actually dealing from my flat. We had the evidence on him within about six weeks of me being there and that allowed for about five or six months. As a result of the early success there, they decided to keep me under. The decision to run longer operations was a new development for the program. Building up criminal credentials took time, so agents were encouraged to push deeper into their scene before police made the arrests that would blow their cover. It was easier to be the part that you were playing than acting the part that you were playing. I figured that out for my own mental health. You were working in an environment where absolutely the most simple slip could have put you in, in extraordinary danger. Any feeling that undercover work is a game is quickly dispelled. The moment every agent prepares for is their first challenge. Questioning of your, of your cover, questioning your identity, questioning your persona, and everyone's got their different ways of, of looking for undercover agents. Everyone's got their different sort of their, their tests and challenges. This guy was, he was absolutely stoned out of his tree and was making up a story about how undercover cops work. The mosaic sort of fitted me and I tried to deal with it as those jokes. He's fucking having me on, aren't you? Having me on, mate. Right? And no, he was quite serious. And I swung the buddy um, pool cue at him and he ducked that. And I took the guy outside and made him hide him. And that ended that problem. I was never challenged again. That solve it. That was the only way to solve it. There was a program called, um, it's in the bag with a, a really nice fellow by the name of Selwyn Toogood. Thank you, Oamaru, and good evening, New Zealand. My sister, uh, Tinika, happened to be uh, one of the people on the show. Tinica Boucher! When we were visiting a town to record a program, I would always in advance give Tony the schedule and where we would be, where we were staying, and uh, when to discuss how we could hook up. I used to sneak in to the production and watch the production, and then uh, she and Selwyn, who was sworn to secrecy, would deliberately have a late meal, a 10.30 or 11 o'clock meal in the hotel, and we'd get a private dining room or go to one of their bedrooms and I'd have dinner with her. And he wanted to know how the rest of the family were doing, who was doing what. It was really just family stuff that we discussed at, at those meetings. Loneliness and isolation are an everyday reality. Not only is it a risk for an agent to contact family, the deeper they are, the harder it is to relate to their old life. For Tony Bouchier, Sister Tenica's TV role on It's In The Bag meant he had the treat of regular family contact that other agents missed out on. 
the bag. On a Saturday night or whenever the programme was going to air, I'd go and hire a motel unit and sit down and watch the programme. So I sort of got a bit of a glimpse of one of the members of my family because, as I say, I had absolutely no contact with them. He told me of this occasion where he checked into this motel and it was just before the programme was starting and the TV wasn't working on TV One. So he raced into the manager's office and demanded that his TV be fixed because he wanted to watch TV One. Well, the manager looked at him most strangely, <laughs> wondering why he wanted to watch us in the bag, because he looked the most unlikely viewer. <laughs> Meantime, Patrick O'Brien was bagging big time criminals. He gathered enough evidence to have Mr. Asia himself, Marty Johnston, arrested for selling him heroin. No one sort of said, oh, wow, we've caught Mr. Asia. Let's fucking unlock them away. It was just, we just caught some guys selling me heroin. Before they could be placed on trial, Johnston and his associates skipped the country. While on bail, they, all of them, all of the, all, everyone that had been charged um, left the country. And so there was never ever a court case. These people were never ever convicted of those offences. It was hugely frustrating for police, especially for the agents who'd been set up as flies in the web. Patrick had played a key role in almost bringing members of New Zealand's most feared drug ring to justice. Thousands of lives had been wrecked in Mr. Asia's slipstream and many more shattered as the key players continued their operation from overseas. Patrick too was becoming a casualty, struggling to reconcile his criminal persona with the cop he once was. In the early days when I went on R&R, &R, I went back to my life as Pat O'Brien. Um, but as time progressed, I found it more and more difficult to turn off the criminal persona when I went on R&R. &R. That was destructive of the, the, few, the few personal relationships that I, I sustained back in my real life. And so what, what, was, what happened was that over time I disconnected from those things in my previous life, like associates, family, friends, and would have nothing to do with them. The man who joined the force to serve and protect was now a law unto himself. I viewed that maintaining a relationship with my operator was actually dangerous to my operation. And so I would try to have as little to do with my operator as possible, certainly on a face-to-face -face basis. I would try and establish secure means of communicating with them by telephone. But as to meeting them, I, I always, tried to find, always tried to find excuses not to meet them. My cover when I first started off was that I was a drug dealer. That no longer really was a cover after a while, it was in fact reality. And I went to Gisborne because they had a perceived drug problem. And I, I realised very quickly after I arrived there, in fact, they didn't, did not have a drug problem because in fact there were no drugs for sale in Gisborne. But I had quite a few and um, over a period of about three or four months, established a good rapport with some local people and these local people agreed to grow, grow large amounts of marijuana for me which they did on back blocks in Gisborne and we ended up having a very successful operation we busted quite a large number of people for growing huge amounts of marijuana. By 18 months two years I was using all, all drugs um, for, for two reasons one, so that I had the experience of using them, so I could talk knowledgeably to, to targets about them. But also I was using them because the drugs became a very effective um, tool to, to help me to continue to work. Patrick was proving the policy of simulation to be a farce. But having broken protocol and sampled all manner of drugs, he was still unprepared for his first bad LSD trip. All the questions about what I was doing all came flooding out. It was difficult because I, not only was I dealing with these things, these, these demons that suddenly just came rushing out, but also I was still having to, to deal with the environment that, in which I was working, so it was really scary. What made it even more scary was the hallucinations had me wearing my police uniform. <laughs> so I was constantly having to remind myself that, no, you're not wearing a uniform, Pat, it's OK. This is a hallucination. <laughs> but that uniform seemed pretty real, I can tell you. <laughs> the trip brought home how two-faced the life of an agent is and how dangerous constant drug taking can be for staying undercover. But the morality of Patrick's double life was most obvious in court. Technically, I perjured myself every time I gave evidence. And 
the perjury was when presenting my evidence to the jury, inevitably the question was asked of me, but constable, weren't you stoned or under the influence of drugs at the time you obtained this evidence? And my answer, which was a lie. I was simulating, Your Honour. Was to tell the jury that no, in fact, I had been simulating. Without exception, the jury would accept my word, but they may have taken a different attitude to my evidence if, had they known that <clears throat> at the time that I say these things happened, in fact, I was smashed off my face. Living a life in which sin and pleasure were mixed with guilt and deception didn't always sit comfortably with the former Catholic schoolboy. I would sometimes get on planes and go to the other end of the country and would find a dark confessional somewhere and talk to a priest. And it was interesting, the advice that I got consistently from the priests was that the lies and the perjury were okay. And the, and the analogy they used, which was probably not a good one, was it was like the policeman chasing the speeding driver. They had to speed to catch the driver. But Patrick discovered there are some acts that are not so easily forgiven. The cop who joined the force to do good was put in a position where he could, but it might mean breaking cover. I was sunbathing on a beach in Wellington near where I lived, and a child was drowning in the surf, and the, the family group she, she was with were panicking and obviously not doing the right thing in terms of resuscitating or saving the child. And I was greatly tormented and eventually prevented myself going down there and assisting, and the child drowned, and that haunted me for a long time because I felt that maybe if I had done something, the child would have, would have lived, and the reason I didn't do anything was be, to pr preserve my cover. And it was kind of cold and calculating. And I realized sort of that's what I had become as an agent. That was probably the beginning of the end for me as, as an undercover agent. Because um, the little walls that I'd built to keep out the good demons <coughs> to enable me to sort of keep going had cracked and, and, and the questions that I had continually sort of ignored and not answered just came crashing in on me. After eight months down south, Tony Bouchier had gathered enough evidence for his termination. The day when all the arrests are made and an agent's cover is blown. Everyone remembers their first termination. Took out somewhere between 70 and 80 people in that period of time. Word came in that the local dealers had put a whole lot of money together to execute me. And I think that was the most frightening experience I had because I knew some of the characters involved and I knew that they were capable of doing it. And we also knew that it was a, a credible threat because we had an agent in there. I was sent down to Stuart Island for a reasonably lengthy period of time until um, they were satisfied that the threat had gone. You feel sort of pretty well helpless as to what you can do. There's nothing you can do. You just sort of sit and wait it out and wait till the, the coast is clear and then come back out, uh, which is what we did. Tony came out of hiding and did another successful stint of undercover work in Auckland. But he was keen to get back to a normal life. He returned to his station determined to give up undercover work and found it wasn't that easy. I kept getting called away to, um, to do short-term jobs, all sorts of things, bookmakers, prostitution, drugs. He was still being pulled two ways and uh, this also hindered him into becoming assimilated back into normal society. So he just couldn't get away from it. Agents are torn between two selves. In a later era, police psychologist Ian Miller put in place measures to help undercovers deal with the trauma of re-entering everyday life. One of the things we learned was that it wasn't a good idea to put the person back in to further undercover duties, unless it was good reason, because you're really running the risk of re-traumatisation. They kept using me, and I couldn't say no. I just loved the work, I couldn't say no. I was probably addicted to it. So I realised that the only way I was going to get away from the work was getting out of the country. I stayed away for 15 months, which was a good time for me, just to be completely away from the work. The longer a person is in, the greater the problem. 
two or three months is one thing. Nine months a year is a whole different matter. If you take it in three month multiples, every three months, the problems go up by a factor of two. So it's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, go up like that very quickly. By this stage, Patrick O'Brien had been undercover for over four years. He was fast approaching his use by date as an agent. Well, I can give you an example of something that happened near the end of my operations was um, in a North Island town and I arrived and the local operator gave me his target and this, they'd been after this target for, for many, many years. And <clears throat> the day after I received the briefing on who the target was, the next day when I met my operator I told him that, yes, I'd met the target and he was very impressed that I had managed to meet the target within the first day. But what kind of actually surprised him and I think raised his, his, his suspicions about me was the fact that not only had I met the target, but in fact I was moving into the to live with the target that later that day. And the operator, being a man of the world, realised that I must have done something pretty outrageous to have gained this man's confidence in that amount of time. Oh, I'll see you. Yeah, have a good one. <laughs> we stood next to each other in a gangbang. Some young girl was put on a block and we were in the line together and laughed and joked our way through the process. He thought I was a good guy. Well, I wasn't really. I wasn't comfortable at all. I felt sorry for the girl. I was in two minds. What do I do here? Do I, do I stop this? You know, or do I just let it happen? And so I just, I suppose, worked professionally to put the work, putting the words in, in quotation marks. So I worked professionally. My, my object was to win the confidence of, the, of this target and from there <clears throat> go on to obtain evidence against him and bring about a successful prosecution, hopefully put him in prison. And so I just remained focused on that. Yeah. And the rest of it just put aside. I was no longer the person that had come into the program, that person had been destroyed. So had it come to a finish, a self-realisation that I couldn't do this anymore, um, and a realisation by the administrators of the program that I was broken, basically. Yeah. So I was told I was going back to Uniform Branch. Uh, it was pretty as simple as that, really. I was Oh, goodbye. Thanks for the memories. <laughs> yeah. Patrick's experiences demonstrated a serious friction between the aims of the program and the means required to achieve it. But despite increasingly negative stories about broken cops, the undercover program was getting results. Battles were being won in the war on drugs, and the stories certainly weren't putting off recruits. Plenty of keen young officers, tempted by the excitement of a different beat, lined up to take the place of the agents who'd fallen by the wayside. One, Horirua Constable Wayne Houseman, caused the program's greatest crisis. When I joined the police, I was very, very straight. Um, perhaps lacking a little bit in confidence and, and things that um, the police brought out confidence in, in dealing with people and... and um, yeah, mixing with people and things. Uh, I was a rugby player, beer drinker. I had been a Sunday school teacher until I joined the police. Um, all that sort of changed. Houseman's time undercover ruined him and forever changed the programme. As the 70s closed, the programme was rocked by a naive young agent pushing the limits of undercover behaviour further than ever before. Thrust into the addictive worlds of vice and heroin, Wayne Houseman went from being a darling of the police force to public enemy number one. Next week on Undercover. He'd arrived around at our place with a dessert bowl full of dope. So I bought breakfast. But I was brave enough to take a stand. It felt like absolute shit to kick him. I couldn't stand the thought of having a needle stuck in me. 